was given to you in your need. been a blessing to someone today, and uh, that should be our goal and motto. Let me just get this out of the way. This is not ketchup on my face, all right? Uh, some people think I forgot to use a napkin today, so uh, do not judge me. My wife says it's my one and only blemish, so um, no, that's not what she said. It's one of many is what she told me, but uh, let's open with prayer, and uh, we'll begin the service tonight. Brother Lamb, would you pray? Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Patch the Pirate and Pee Wee Club, be gone. Get out of here. Go to class. Yes, very good. All right. You guys go have fun. All right. Okay. If you would all, I know it came through uh, the prayer chain, and I, I think we, we do need to pray. I know there was a, a shooting there at Michigan State campus, at just a, a little ways from where I grew up, um, just a, a, several minutes away. But um, I just let's pray for those families. I still don't know all the details. Maybe some of you saw that, but uh, be in prayer for that. And then I know Amanda has some, some friends that really went, had an accident. And um, Would you be in prayer for this family and friends of... Amanda here, and uh, just a lot of heartache. And let's be in prayer for one another. We need Wednesday night more than ever, don't we? We're going to take some time to pray together, and I really hope you'll take some time tonight and maybe grab, not literally grab somebody, but just get with somebody and just pray and beg God for some things. And uh, we'll do that here in just a little bit. Brother Brian, would you come up and read our prayer letter tonight? I believe this is the Morgans. The Morgans to... Uh, to they're headed to Japan. I think they're headed out in I think March 1st. They're headed over there um, I was on the phone with three missionaries today a couple of them are coming in March and uh, looking forward to them being here and uh, Just be in prayer for a lot of trials. We we support missionaries and in, in uh, closed countries who literally if they find out they are missionaries they will come and uh, kick them out of the country. That would be best case scenario. Worst case could be a lot worse. Uh, so you be in prayer for our missionaries. And uh, let's pray for the Morgans. Would you read the letter for us tonight, Brother Brian? Says, Dear pastors and praying friends, after returning from Japan, we enjoyed spending time with our family during and after Christmas as we began 2023. I had the privilege of preaching the morning and evening services in on New Year's Day at our home church, Regency Baptist Church in Loomis, California. We are always grateful for the time we get to spend with these people whom we love dearly. In the middle of January, we got back on the deputation trail with the missions conference in Missouri. We had a great time with old friends and new ones as well. One of the biggest blessings was that an old college friend of mine, of my wife's, who lived in the area, saw we were coming to town. She contacted my wife, who invited her to join the services. After my wife's friend and her family came for two of the services, they felt God was leading them to this church. They had since joined the church and are attending faithfully. Also during one of the services, a young man came up to me and asked if I could help him make sure of his salvation. After spending time with him and showing him verses, he bowed his head to trust Christ as his Savior once and for all. After we turned to our, our seats, my eldest daughter, Sienna, leaned over and told me that she was not sure she was saved either. 
I took her aside and after careful explanation and going through many verses, she made sure of her salvation. If all of that were not enough, unbeknownst to me at the same time, two of my sons were also being dealt with by fellow missionary. To God be all the glory. We then flew back to California after the conference. While on a layover at the airport, I had the privilege of joining another missions conference at a church in Virginia via Zoom. I was able to share my testimony, my field, and the brief challenge from the Bible. I was greatly encouraged by this service and how God allowed technology to be used for his glory. The following weekend, we participated in another wonderful missions conference in Windemar, California. This conference was so encouraging. A special blessing we received at the conference was that we already knew almost all of the other missionaries present. One big special blessing is that we met Dan and Kathy Strickland, the parents of Dan Daniela Oishi, our fellow missionary in Japan. They were so kind and hospitable to us and treated us like family. Right after that, I flew to Mobile, Alabama, Alabama area for missions emphasis month at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Theodore. I was blessed to speak to many of the children's classes in the Christian school, preach the teen chapel, go so winning with the teens and present our ministry during the evening service. While so winning there, the first door we knocked on was a woman from Japan, which was a special blessing. I got to practice my Japanese with her and invite her to the church. She claimed that she was already a Christian and was encouraged that we were going to Japan, which is such a difficult place to witness for Christ. After flying back to California, we spent the following weekend at Central Baptist Church, Sutherland, Oregon. The extra special blessing of the meeting that Pastor Jimmy Moyer was the uh, Sunday school teacher, who after my wife initially shared the gospel with me, I returned to church the next day time led me to Christ. All these years later, what a joy it was to see that his family is still faithful in ministry and that one of the converts was on the way to the mission field. Finally, we spent the following weekend close to home in Northern California at Harvest Baptist Church in Orland, California. Pastor Isaac Davis, his family and the church were so kind to us and made us feel like we were a part of their church. This was also the last deputation meeting where our whole family would be present. From here on out, it will either be just my wife and me or I'll or be attending a couple of meetings alone. We thank God for this amazing provisions for us during deputation. We are now at 96% and expected to have full support by the time we leave for the field, which will be on March 1st. As we have already purchased our tickets, thank you all so much for your prayers and financial support. We truly would not be able to do this without you all. Lord willing, I will write our next prayer letter from Japan. Please pray that we can finish packing our belongings and taking that uh, belongings we are taking and that we will have all of the funds we need for furniture, moving and eventually purchasing a new vehicle. May God richly bless you as you labor for him. In his service, Brendan Morgan. How many of you remember them coming here to the church? The Morgan family, several of you were here for it. Uh, they've got a lot of children, and they are headed over to Japan. I can tell you firsthand, it takes a lot to pack your life into totes, and especially when you have several children. Uh, with Dan and Aaron, we stacked totes up and had to carry them in. You be in prayer for the excuse me, the Morgan family, as they get over there and share the gospel. Take your hymnals, go to hymn 398. We'll sing about the Lord the same yesterday, today, and forever, 398. Brother Brian, would you lead us in the first verse? Then we'll greet one another and say howdy.
States will sing the last verse. to sing that brother brian i just thought of the chorus so i was starting on the chorus and i, I blew i blew that so all right good all right um several things um we have uh this coming sunday evening a business meeting and uh, i hope you're there for that as we discuss uh, several things uh, in the upcoming year for the church and to see uh, d different things that the church is going to do. Um, also, March 2nd, we'll have our local uh, mission dinner there at Muncie Mission, and uh, we'll have a, a missionary live stream on March 5th. Um, I sent an email today. There's a couple missionaries um, I've asked to be a part of that. Uh, we'll just see if it fits with their schedule. We're going to try to go live uh, with them. So you be in prayer about that. And uh, for the month of missions, uh, March 8th, um, folks, be here March 8th. It's a Wednesday evening. I am going to push as many people as I can get to be here. There's very few excuses to make not to be here on March 8th. And uh, we're going to have... Uh, a missionary to Team Eurasia. Those who may watch only on Facebook, I encourage you that night be here. Um, we are not going to go live on Facebook till the preaching, uh, just due to, to, to safety and what he can say uh, from the place he's at. This is a very godly man, very seasoned veteran for the Lord, and uh, he knows his Bible, and I promise you, you will leave here blessed March 8th, you be here, and, uh, well, the rest of them, you be here, too, but that one for sure. Um, ushers, go ahead and come forward. A couple's dinner on February 23rd. If you're going to that, uh, it's in Pendleton. Make sure you sign up. Uh, the deadline to sign up will be this Sunday. Also, if you're going to need a babysitter, 
Should I say babysitter? Uh, what, what should I say? It's not babysitter. It's not babies. Uh, child care services. Child care services. Please let Miss Jessica know so she can count. She's, she's such a blessing and helping in that area. And uh, you make sure you let her know if you need to, to have them help with that. I know she's going to be keeping an eye on ours. So some of you wives that want to leave your husbands here and just go to dinner alone, I guess, um, you know, if they need to be watched over and uh, taken care of to stay out of trouble, uh, you know, she'll, she'll have games and she'll have snacks, no doubt. So they'll be all right. Let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll take up this offering. Sean, would you pray for the offering tonight? As they take it up, let's turn to page 456. 456, I need thee every hour. We'll just sing the first and the last. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no take some prayer requests tonight if we can't I know there's several I know we have a lot of things to be praying about and uh, Miss Connie does such a great job with that prayer chain and I don't know about you but it's such a blessing to have a church that prays and uh, cares and I think uh, Miss Connie she puts a lot of work into that and uh, several of you send her text with issues going on and I know Connie and Houston they're prayer warriors and uh, they pray uh, and I appreciate them both. But what are we praying for this evening? Um, I don't think we got the, the prayer list out here tonight, so just find a piece of paper and a pen. What are we praying for tonight? Uh, yes? Yeah, the lambs have been dealing with stuff for the last weeks. Just never, last, last ever. Yeah, just sign his stuff and everything else. Yeah, would you pray for the lambs just to... Get rid of this stuff, whatever it is. Um, someone else tonight? Uh, prayer request. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Brother Houston was supposed to have that MRI today, and due to some complications, um, he had to put it off till tomorrow. So they got to go back there again tomorrow. Uh, just be in prayer for the the odds if you would. What else are we praying for tonight? Yes, ma'am. Yes, he does. All right. All right. Would you pray for Miss Eileen? 
it is hard when you get attached to an animal and you see them suffer. That's, that's a hard thing to deal with. So would you pray for Miss Eileen as, uh, so God will give her wisdom on how to handle this. Anybody else? Yes. 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 Would you pray uh, for, yes, pray for Frank Garlock. He's associated with Majesty Music and uh, is, uh, writes music all over the place. He's a great man, a great man of God, heard several great things. I've never personally met him, but I know he had an impact on, on our life uh, just through music. So pray for Frank Garlock. Uh, yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord for friends of the dots, their daughter Kim with this stroke and brain bleed and everything she's had to endure. Continue to pray for her, but we do praise the Lord for the progress. Praise the Lord for that. Anybody else tonight? Yes, sir. Would you all pray for Miss D? Uh, she's the neighbor to Bob over there. If you'd pray for Miss D. Yes, ma'am? Oh, boy. Okay. Bob and Barbara's daughter of the flu. All right. Anything? Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, pray for Shelley Hamilton, if you would. It's all associated with Majesty Music, with the Patch the Pirate, and uh, along those, uh, those lines. For those who may not know exactly what all that is, uh, just a very godly family. We want to pray for them during this time. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. From uh, the song leader up there at uh, in Fort Wayne, is it New Heights? New Heights. He's a song leader up there. Would you pray for this man? I have met him. A godly man, loves the Lord, and to just pray for their family. What What is their last name? Johnson. Would you pray for the Johnsons tonight? Um, yeah, man. I didn't know, hear about that. Anything else? Anything else? Um, all right. All right. Take your Bibles tonight. Um, we are going to be in the book of First Samuel. First Samuel. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. We started this series, the book of First Samuel, with the idea God is in control. Would you all agree with that? God is in control, and we'll see that time again, time and again, time and again. We're going to see this over and over, but I want to see this more uh, personally applied here. We're going to shift from the story and life of Samuel, even though he'll be included here, but we're going to start to shift into the rise and the fall of Saul. The rise and the fall of Saul. So the rest of the book of 1 Samuel is going to be for the most part, with Saul as king. Now, towards the end, God is going to send a prophet. He's going to reject Saul as king. But God is going to give Saul every chance to be the king that Israel needs. And, of course, God already knew what would happen. 
David is going to come on the scene and we'll see David throughout. So for the rest of the book, we're going to see the next couple chapters, we'll see Saul predominantly, but eventually here we'll get to David and we'll kind of have both back and forth and Samuel will be a part of some of that as we begin tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. And uh, I was thinking of a clever title for tonight, and uh, a lot of things, but what can God do with a bunch of donkeys? What can God do with a bunch of donkeys? Um, it's interesting throughout the Bible how God uses animals in different ways, in different facets, and, uh, and if I can just say this, uh, the donkeys obeyed God better than most of us do sometimes. You'll see what I'm saying here in just a moment. Um, it's very interesting. God uses animals here to put Saul where he needs to be. It's very interesting, and you're going to see a lot of so-called coincidences come to place here, even though we know these aren't coincidences. God has a plan. God has a purpose, and God is going to give Saul a chance. Saul is the one who makes a choice here, and he'll turn away from God. He'll let things get between him and God. Let's pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 9, and we'll read a few of these verses. We'll read the first two, and then we're going to look at different sections throughout the chapter here, and we'll look at the rise and fall of Saul. You remember, God is preparing his way for the coming Messiah. Right? The Messiah would come. He's already promised that would happen. And now it's going to come through David eventually here. We'll get to David. But God is working behind the scenes. But what can God do with a bunch of donkeys? Let's look at this tonight. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Becherath, the son of... I don't even know why I say all these names. You could pronounce them better than I can. The son of Aphiah as a Benjaminite. Notice this phrase here. A mighty man of what? Power. This was a very well-known, prominent individual. So Saul came from a very well-known family. Look at verse 2 as he explains what's going on. And he had a son whose name was Saul. Notice this description. He was a choice young man and a goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a what? Notice it doesn't say a godlier person. It says a goodlier person. And this would entail his character. As we'll see later on in the chapter, he was a modest individual. He was a humble individual. We'll see that later on. But it's interesting here. Look at the end of verse 2. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. Now, don't get confused. He didn't have a super long neck. It's just the idea he was a tall man. He was a sharp-looking individual. In our day and age, he would have been on all the stores. As you go through the checkout line, you have these magazines, and you have all these sharp people and all these beautiful people and handsome people and everyone on the magazine rack. This is where Saul would be. Right? I don't, I don't know the names of all the, 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 the magazines like that. But he would be on those magazines. He was a sharp guy. Good looking man. Strong man. He was the ideal candidate for the king. For the kingship. But still under this idea that God is in control, we're going to see the rise and fall of Saul. We're going to see even in the midst of a people whose hearts were cold to the Lord, God still had mercy on them and still showed grace to them. They're the ones who said no. You remember back in chapter 8, why did Israel want a king? Because everyone else had him. The Philistines down south, the Amorites, I think they were on the, uh, I think they were on the, the west. We see the, the Perizzites and the, all the other ites, all the other groups around them, they all had a king. So Israel wanted a king. We saw last week that I believe God would have given them a king at a certain time when he was ready. But they said, not yet. We, we are ready for one now. And now, Saul, the one that everyone would dream of to have as king. 
is going to come on the scene. But understand this, in chapter 8, uh, we see that he warned them about what a king would do. You remember verses 10 through 18? Samuel warns the people in verse 14, he'll take your fields. In verse 13, he'll take your daughters and he'll take uh, the tenth of your seed. In verse 15, he'll take your men servants. In verse 16, he'll take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. God warned them. God had protected protected them. You remember back through the book of Judges, every time they turned to him, God would send a judge and he would deliver them from the people. God's protected them. God's warned them. And now look at verse 20 of chapter 8. That we may also be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and do what? Now one thing we know about Saul in just a few chapters, he didn't live up to that. Even though he was taller, he was stronger, he was sharper. Came from a good heritage, a good family. Had it all together. And yet, this was not God's plan or purpose. And yet, the people said, we want it. God said, all right. They are not rejecting you, Samuel. Can you imagine Samuel? He's been the prophet, the priest, for all, or the prophet for all this time. And they come up and say, Samuel, you know what? You've done a good job. You're getting old. Your kids are bad. We don't trust them. So we need a king. You know, Samuel could have taken that personally. I kind of think he may have. And that's why God said, you know what, Samuel? They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. After all God has done for them, he's protected them. He's warned them. He's guided them. And they said, nope, we want to do it our way. Anyone ever done that before? Yeah. God, you've done so much for me, but I think I got this one right now. So we see the condition of the people. I think verse 1 and 2 is a description of the children of Israel. The the condition of the people, if you're taking notes tonight, uh, each one of the points is going to have a, a word with the letter C in it. We're going to see the condition of the people. Saul was just what the people wanted. Just what the people wanted. In verses 1 and 2... You'll see later on throughout the books with the kings in them, you'll see God gives a description of each king, right? You remember, he'll say, and he loved the Lord, or he walked with God, or he was away from God. In these first two verses, we see nothing about God or his plan or his will here. We see everything about uh, his family. We see everything about his heritage. We see everything about who Saul was, but very little about God. No mention of God, just he was a part of God's people. He was choice. He was his family in appearance. That's what was the big deal here. He is his father, Kish. The father of Saul was a wealthy and influential man. He was a good person. He was taller than others. I find this phrase, Saul reflected the spiritual state of the whole nation of Israel. They may have presented a spiritual image, but their heart was far from where God wanted it to be. They presented a spiritual image. But they were not where God wanted them to be. God was not ready for them to have a king. They said, we reject what you have to say. We want a king. They were not in God's timetable. We talked about that last week. So we see here, they, in, this, in these first few verses, verses 1 through 5, they are chasing donkeys. So Kish, influential man, a lot of livestock, a lot of animals, they lose their donkeys. The donkeys are going out, they're they're running free, and God is guiding them. And I had a map, it was very interesting, and I forgot to put it up tonight, I was going to have it up here. But there's a map of where all these donkeys went. It was incredible. Uh, From what people tell us, Saul probably traveled in this short period of time about 25 miles, until eventually he got right to where God wanted him to be. The donkeys would lead him, and then we'll look at that here and more just a little bit. But let's see the condition of the people. I would ask you tonight, what is your condition? Do you reflect a spiritual state, maybe a spiritual image? But where's your heart? Where's your heart at tonight? Where's your heart? Saul's heart was not where it needed to be. Jump down to verse uh, 5 and 6, if you would. Verse 5 and 6. We're seeing the condition of the people. We'll jump through portions of this chapter. In verse 5, And when they were come to the land of Zeph, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come and let us what? Return, lest my father leave, caring for the asses, and take thought for us. 
So I want you to see, as they're running, they're chasing these donkeys all over the place. They come to a spot, and Saul says, you know what, let's go home, because Dad's going to get worried, and you know they'll start worrying about us, let's just go back. Did Saul bring up the idea of going to find the man of God? No. Saul said, let's go back. They were cornered here. Have you ever felt cornered? Nowhere else to go, kind of frustrated. It, let me ask it this way. Have you ever had circumstances come your way and they are frustrating? They're out of your control. They're frustrating. It's interesting. We'll see at the end of the story tonight, God used a frustrating experience to put Saul right where he wanted him. Because today you and I have frustrating experience. We have things happen we wish wouldn't happen. But do you know that God can work in those frustrating experiences? And that's what's going to happen here. They're cornered. Uh, we have nowhere to go. Some may get worried about us. Some are going to try to find us. But listen, God was directing them all along. This frustrated Saul. Yet God worked out his plan through the lost donkeys in a way Saul couldn't even imagine. God will use frustrating times in our lives to get us to a place he wants us to be. Now, I think we can take this too far both ways. Like we see everything that happens and we're like, oh man, this is God doing this. Or sometimes we don't see God in anything. But I do think it's important to realize God has a plan and God has a purpose and we have to trust him. Even through those hardships, those difficult circumstances. These donkeys could have gone anywhere, but they went exactly where God wanted them to go. Listen to this. I love this quote. They submitted themselves to what God wanted. These donkeys were smart enough to submit to God. As they're cornered, look at verse 6, if you would. Look at verse 6. So we see the condition of Israel. They had more of a, a spiritual image, but they were not godly. Now I want you to see when they're cornered and when you and I get cornered at times and we're frustrated because of a circumstance, I find this very interesting. Look at verse 6. So his servant said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a who? A man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither. Peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. Sometimes when you feel cornered, that frustrating experience you have, sometimes you get cornered. Isn't it interesting that sometimes God will use the people around us to encourage us? To point us in a right direction. By the way, I think it's important to have good friends too. I think it's important to have a good church family. Because sometimes you're going to feel cornered because of a circumstance that's beyond your control. And you need someone out there saying, hey Saul, don't turn back. There's something big for you up here. God just has a plan. You need to go find God. And in this case, go find the man of God. Back then was a little different. We have God's words today. But they would go hear from God, from the man of God. And he said, hey, let's not give up. Let's go find the man of God here. And maybe the man of God can tell us where the donkeys are so we don't go back as failures. Sometimes when you're cornered, you know what you need? You need somebody to point you in the right direction. That's why it's good to have the right friends, the right church family, the right people to hang around. Because listen, a lot of people get cornered. What do they do? They turn and run. I think it's important, you know, that's where young people are today. They get the wrong friends, the wrong group of people around them. And what happens when they face a difficulty? They turn and run. And I don't want to make too big of a deal about this because I don't necessarily believe that Saul for one minute was a godly man and was going to go to the, 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 the God, God's man. He's going to go and say, you know, hey, I know God can do this. No, I don't, I don't think that for a minute. I don't think this is showing Saul as some uh, great, great godly man. Look at verse 7. Then said Saul to his servant, but behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? Now, Samuel didn't charge for his services, but in this culture, generally people would bring a gift of some sort to honor them. And Saul makes excuses. Saul says, we don't have anything left to give him. It's interesting that his friend comes up and he says, you know what? In verse, verse 8 here, he said, no, I've got a, a shekel of silver. I'll, I'll take care of this. I've got a little bit left. I'll make sure we have something. Let's just go find the man of God. And I'll just encourage you. I don't want to make too much of this, but make sure you're around the right people. 
please, 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 please don't go to Facebook when you're going in your corner. Be careful about that stuff. There's a lot of advice and a lot of opinions. You find godly people to go to when you're cornered. Better yet, you be a godly person that someone can come to when they're cornered. Because godly people get cornered. We are going through things and difficulties and we need to go to someone who's going to point us in the right way and won't let us use excuses to run away from God. I've got people in my life, they'll keep me on the right path. I hope you do too. I really do. And we see here as they're cornered, he has an individual and God pushes him to go find the man of God. So look down at verse, uh, verse 10. Verse 10. Then said Saul to his servant, well said, come let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. Now, I want you to see under this point, as they're cornered, God is working with the people around you. But I also want you to see as a sub point, God is working in the timing of events. God is working in the timing of events that are happening in your life. Verse 11 through verse 13, they come to uh, draw water and some, some ladies come to them, some maidens come out there and they say, Saul, hey, uh, you're looking for the man of God? You're looking for the seer? You're looking for the prophet? Guess what? You picked a good day to be here because he's in town. Coincidence, isn't it? No, 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 no. God was working behind the scenes. Now, some people believe that uh, these uh, ladies were used by God, and some historians believe that they thought Saul was a sharp-looking fella, and they wanted Saul to stay in the city. So they were just making up the story. But regardless, they, they said, Saul, go to the city. The seer is there. God is working in the timing of events. Your time clock and your timing is not as good as God's. It's not as good as God's. Man, don't we all have to learn this more? Take your Bible, go to 1 Samuel chapter 23, would you? 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. Something David came to realize that his time clock was not the same as God's. Okay, look at 1 Samuel chapter 23, and we're going to look into all this later on. And uh, David, in verses 9 through 12, he's seeking for God's will and God's direction in his life. But I want you to jump down to verse 14 of chapter 23. Look at this important lesson that David learns. And David abode in the wilderness in the strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day. But this is what David noticed, and this is what David understood, and David would write several psalms on this, and that is, but God delivered him not into his hand. My friend, your time clock and your decisions and what you think should happen may not line up with God's time clock. And I would say God's time clock is much better than ours. David had to learn, and David saw, you know what? There were times when Saul could have got me, and there were times when Saul could have killed me and taken my life, and all these bad things could have happened, but God didn't let me out of his hands. <laughs> God controlled my destiny. God took care of me. I think it's important tonight to, you know, we always want to tell God, this is my clock. This is what I expect. This is not what I hope. This is what needs to happen. And I'll give you a list of reasons why, God. Because I'm this, because I'm this, because I've done this, because I'm, I'd be so much better for you. No, no, no. God's time clock's not our time clock. God's time clock is not our time clock. When you get cornered because of frustrating circumstances, you make sure you remember it's not our time clock. It's his. And I hope you and I can one day say, maybe it's a little more challenging when we're going through that frustration, but maybe you and I could say when we come out on the other side of that frustration, we could look back and say, you know what? That could have happened and that could have happened, but God brought me through it. And God is still keeping me going. This is what David would learn later on. But I want you to see next in verse 14 and 15 here. Verse 14 and 15, and I encourage you, read all of these verses in context uh, later on, but we just don't have time. Uh, verse 14, and they went up into the city, and when they were come into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear, 
It's the idea of back then, maybe you see in uh, you know, some of the videos in, in more of the Middle Eastern culture, they would have like headwear around their heads. So when he says he whispered in his ear, it's the idea of he took the headwear off and spoke into his ear. Now, does that mean God came down from heaven and walked up to Samuel and took that up? No, no, no. It means that God spoke to him in some way here and had told Samuel this. Verse 16. Tomorrow... About this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin. I want you to write down, God is in control. God was in control. God is in control. Nothing surprises God or catches him off guard. Nothing surprises God or catches him off guard. I love this little story. The story is told of a little boy who had been invited to a friend's birthday party. He was so excited and started counting the days until the party. The morning of the party, he was devastated when he found out that a blizzard had struck their little town. The snow was falling in wet, heavy flakes, and the wind was howling. I don't think you should go to the party, said his father. The little boy was so disappointed. He began to beg his father, uh, pleading with him to be allowed to go. Finally, much to his surprise, his dad said, all right, you can go to the party. The little boy bundled up in his hat and his coat and his mittens and started down the street to his friend's house. When he got to the door, he turned around and saw his father turning to walk back home. It was then he realized that his father had been walking behind him all the way to make sure he was safe. You ever feel those times where you're alone and the prayers aren't working and nobody's around and you just feel lonely? Can I tell you this? You need to look back because God's there. God's watching. God is in control. God knows the circumstances. Whoops. It's interesting to me what God is doing even today to teach me something tomorrow. It's interesting to me what God is doing even today to teach me something tomorrow. What is God doing in your life that he's teaching you something for tomorrow? Or he's directing you to where he wants you to be. Or he's slowly getting to you to a place where he can finally use you. I don't know your situation. I don't know your circumstance. But God is in control. God is in control. I want you to, want you to write this down. And we'll, we'll, we'll start getting towards the end here. I want you to write this down. God's consistency. God's consistency. So God comes to him and he tells him very specifically in verse 16, tomorrow I will send a man out of the land of Benjamin. Now, let me ask you this. Did God tell Samuel how he would look or what his stature would be? No. He just said, tomorrow I'll send you a fella. Samuel, just go about your way. I'll, I'll bring him to you. I'll bring him to you because God is consistent and God is going to keep his word. God has made promises in the past and God will never change who he is. God was giving Saul a chance to change. We're going to see that as the story continues here. Look at the end of verse 16. And this is what God told the Samuel very specifically. A man's going to come, you're going to meet him, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel that he may what? Save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry is come unto me. Now, it was this God's original plan. No, he wasn't going to have a king yet. He was going to use the judges. He was going to use Samuel. He would have used somebody after Samuel. He would have had it all taken care of. But Israel said, no, we want a king. We want to be like everyone else. We don't want another prophet. We want a king. Because he can do a lot better than a prophet can. He can do a lot better than God can. But my friend, God is so consistent. God said he would take care of his people. Amen. And what does God do? He takes care of his people, even though his people, if I can say this, are a bunch of knuckleheads. <laughs> right. They said we reject your will, God. What do we do sometimes? Sometimes we can be. Can I say this a little bit of a knucklehead? <laughs> do we ever reject God's perfect will for our life? Sure. Absolutely. There are times where he sets things in place and he said, just trust me. And we're not full of faith. We're full of doubt. Men will change, but God never will. God was going to bring his Messiah. God would save his people from his sin. God had a big plan. God's plan is bigger than your circumstances. God's plan is bigger than you know and understand. 
I know we as Christians think, even, even adult Christians, we think we know. We think we've got it together. God's plan is bigger than your understanding. God's plan is bigger than your circumstances. God's plan is bigger than you could imagine. God's will, or excuse me, God will only tell you what you need to know. It's interesting here he tells Samuel just what Samuel needed to know. God doesn't have to tell you everything. Though there were many problems with the reign of Saul, no one should think it a total disaster. Saul would have many victories. Lastly tonight, I want to finish with this. When we seek God, and have the right heart, God's will will be very clear. Now, I'll explain this. Not, sometimes God's will seems a little fuzzy. Sometimes it seems like, you know, God is not 100% clear. So in time, God's will will be very clear. Look down at verse 17, if you will, with me tonight. Just a few more verses. I want you to see God's clarity. Verse 17. And when Samuel saw Saul... Say that ten times fast. Samuel saw Saul. Good grief. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall what? Why? Because God still cared for his people, even though they said they wanted a different way. They didn't want to trust him. They wanted a king to put their trust in. Don't you love God? Don't you love him? Because you've done the same thing, whether you admit it or not. I have too. We've had our will, we've had our way, we've had our timing, and we've told God what would be best. And yet God's still there. God still was going to keep his word. God still loves you even when you blow it. Even when you doubt him, God still cares. God still loves. I don't know how. Man, I have a hard time sometimes when people, uh, you know, do things or doubt me or say things about me. Don't you? Don't you get frustrated? God says, you know what? I'll keep my word. I'll still be here. I won't leave. I'll still love you. What a great God we serve tonight. I will tell you, Samuel, when you're close. By the way, friend, Abraham did not see everything God had in store. Abraham just lived by faith. Joseph did not see everything God would do. Joseph just did the right thing, even in bad times. Noah was unaware of what God was capable of. He'd never seen rain before. He just said, you know what? God's timing is better than mine. God can do it. He knows best. I just need to trust. God's will becomes clear. Not that you see days and years down the road, but you know what you need to do today. I need to be faithful to him. I need to walk with him. I need to do the right thing. God's will today. And then God's will will become more clear to you. When you are lined up with the things of God and humbling yourself to him, God will speak and you can hear. There is enough in the Bible that is clearly pointed out that I need to work on. So many times, can I just say this? And We're just about through. Can I just say this? Sometimes we focus on all the things that we don't know in the Bible. We love all the fussing and all the fighting, but the things that are clearly revealed, we spend very little time on those things, don't we? We want to know everything about this and everything about Ezekiel and everything about Jeremiah. Sometimes we get caught up in the things that we don't know just to fight. <laughs> when God says, man, I, I love you, I care about you, I sent my son to die for you, there's all these things you can be doing. So Samuel comes to him and he finds him and basically Samuel tells him, um, walks up to the fellow, Saul's coming, Saul doesn't know Samuel, Saul's only heard of Samuel. Samuel walks out, Samuel has never seen Saul before, but God tells Samuel, this is the guy, go up to him, he goes up to Saul and says, hey, you looking for me? <laughs> I am the prophet, I'm the seer. And then Saul could have said, you know, I, you know who, are, what, what, who are you? But notice what Samuel says in verse 20. He said, as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them. So how does Saul know he's a man of God? Because God tells Samuel about the situation he's going through. So now Saul comes up to Samuel. Samuel says, hey, I'm the prophet, I'm the seer. Then God tells Samuel, hey, don't worry about the donkeys. I'm leading them. I'm taking care of your donkey. I'll take care of all of that. Next chapter, we're going to see he's going to get the donkeys back. He's going to be able to go home with the donkeys. Plus, he's going to be able to go home and tell mom and dad, hey, you'll never believe it. I'm your king. <laughs> right? Hey, he's going to be able to go tell his prominent dad, Kish. He's going to say, hey, uh, I'm your king. Start paying taxes, buddy. All right? Uh, you know, I'd be awkward going home to my dad telling, hey, I'm president. Come on now. I'm in charge of Congress right now. 
where is that coming from? God is clear, and God comes up to him, and he tells him, You're, I know where the donkeys are. I'll take care of the donkeys. You just focus on what I have to say. And then Saul answers in verse 21 and shows his humility. They go back to dinner. They have dinner. So he comes in. Samuel says, hey, we've saved the best food for you. You are going to be royalty. They bring him the best food out. They give him the place of honor. They set him up with all these things. At the end of the chapter, they get up to leave. They're talking all night. Samuel sends everyone else away. He keeps Saul behind. And notice the last phrase of verse 27, would you? And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Let me tell you what God had to say. Saul, this is bigger than you can ever imagine. Saul, this is bigger than you can handle. Saul, this is a major thing. Let me show you what God has in store. Those donkeys, hey, I'll take care of the donkeys. We'll get the donkeys back. Don't worry about it. God led Saul to the place he needed him. If you look on a map, they'll go around like this, way out here, way up by Gilgal, and then he'll come down uh, to this area, and he'll come back here. God led those donkeys, led him on a major goose chase. I don't know where the donkeys were. Maybe God, I don't know what he did with them, you know, uh, put the prince in the sand and lifted the donkeys. Who knows how God did it? But God brought Saul right where he needed to be. Now Saul is here. Now God shares the word of God with him in very clarity. And in chapter 10, verse 1, Samuel takes some oil, anoints, and there's a lot of significance to the oil. But he takes the oil, he dumps it on his head, he anoints him. And now he is the king of Israel. In just a short while, they'll come out publicly. It wasn't time just yet, but they'll come out publicly. Do you see all these things? I want you to see, as we turn to Saul in his life, God gave Saul every chance. Saul's the one who's going to blow it. Why? God was directing him. To this point, he followed the donkeys. Then he'll humble himself. He'll follow for a little while. And then he's going to get too big for his britches and things are going to happen. But listen, friend. God will direct us. God has a bigger plan. God will use those circumstances that are miserable. Flat tires. <laughs> lines at the grocery store. Right? God will use issues. And he will get us to where he wants us to go. The question is, will we follow? Will we listen? Many times we don't understand the circumstances in our lives. They may not seem important at all in the big scheme of things. They can tire us. And yet, they can be used by God to pivot our lives. Would you stay focused on him? Stay focused on his plan. He can use some donkeys to achieve his plan. He can use me. He can use you. Would you stay focused on him? Don't get caught up in the negative circumstances. Don't get caught up in the drama. Don't get caught up in the hurt. You stay focused on him. He'll get you there. He's got a plan for you. Even in these end times that we're living in, as things get crazy, he's got a plan for you. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. Lord, I thank you for this story and this illustration you've given us, God. Lord, you took a man, and he was exactly what the children of Israel wanted. God, it amazes me that you loved your people. God, it's so crazy after all they did to you. God, it's amazing you love me after all I've done to you, all of my sin. God, I just thank you that you can use our circumstances that at times seem overwhelming, that at times seems almost too hard to bear. And God, if we'll just focus on you, God, maybe we use that circumstance to pivot our life to be better servants for you. I don't know your plan. I don't know your goal. But, God, I do understand this. You're in control. And we want to be servants for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a story. I hope you'll read ahead for next week. Let's just take a few minutes to pray, if you would. Find somebody to pray with. Pray with them. Um, Ask them a need that they may have. And let's just be silent in the auditorium just for a little while. You don't know. Someone in this room may need you right now. They may be going through something. And I hope you'll take this very seriously here in these next few months.